My name is Rick. I'm a 42-year-old detective, but I don't investigate crime. I'm a paranormal detective, and I travel all over the world seeking answers from the unknown. One of the worst locations I've ever done is at an abandoned motel in Glasgow, Scotland. I have returned after a year in hopes to receive some closure about the thing that took my wife from me that night. My usual protocol is to do a series of interviews with the locals and other hunters who have done investigations. I have a team that goes with me and a camera crew that helps to set things up. For this, I wanted to go in alone. No cameras, no crews, no interviews. But my best friend Albert insisted he go with me. He and I are the only ones who know about this. I parked the rental car in the back of the building and we climbed in through a broken window that led to the kitchen. To say I was nervous is an understatement. The energy that hit me as soon as I entered the dark building, that stink of mold and rot felt as though a hand clasped around my throat. I took out my phone and turned on the flashlight. I looked around and so far, nothing had shown itself. I called out my wife's name, Penelope. No answer. In my peripheral vision, I saw a dark shadow rush across the doorway. I shined my light on it, but nothing was there. I looked at Albert. Did you see that too? Albert nodded. Yeah, I did. I hope you find what you're looking for. This place scared us all. I wanted to do this alone, I said. You would have been a fool to have done it alone. I can't let you, Rick, Albert said. I appreciate it. Anything for you, buddy. Albert and I treaded carefully through the building. As we walked, we could see blood stains on tattered curtains, rat feces on the rugs, small dead animals all over the place. This place smells bad, Albert groaned as he pulled his shirt up over his nose. Good thing we got our shots from the first time, I said. Suddenly, Albert took a step and the floorboard caved beneath him and he fell down to the basement. Albert! I yelled and went to rush downstairs to find him. I turned a corner and could hear a woman sobbing loudly on the second floor. I stopped to listen closely as I recognized the sound of her weeping. Penelope? I had forgotten about Albert and rushed up to the second floor. I walked slowly, my hands trembling as I held up my phone's flashlight to guide me. The sobbing grew louder, more intense. I followed the sound to a room down the hall. I opened the door, and like a dream, there she was, my Penelope. She sat on a bed, wailing in agony. I rushed to her side. Penelope, it's Rick, I told her. She said nothing, didn't even look at me, just sat there and sobbed loudly. Penny, I frowned and reached for her hand. I touched her hand, and it was cold as ice. Penny, I haven't slept a decent wink since I lost you. I'm here now. You don't have to be in this place anymore. I reached up to brush her hair from her face, and what I saw made my blood run cold. It was Penelope's face, her body, her hands. But she was not my Penelope that I remember. She looked me in the eye, and she had no eyes, just black holes. She flashed a sinister smile at me. Her mouth was missing teeth, and she had aged at least 50 years. Penelope let out a blood curtain scream and chased me out of the room. I ran downstairs and remembered Albert was with me and that he'd fallen through the floor. I pried the basement door open and ran down there. I found the hole where he fell and looked around. I looked up to see Penelope floating in the air. She stared at me with those black, empty holes where her eyes used to be. I looked down where she stood and found Albert. The fall had killed him. Blood drizzled out of his mouth and around his head. I rushed to him and dropped to my knees. Penelope still hovered above him. My best friend was gone. Damn fool for coming with me. I came back with the last person I had, and now he's gone. I looked up at Penelope and she began to laugh maniacally. It was then that I realized what had happened. I heard of Scottish and Irish folklore. I've studied all of it in my line of work. My wife was no longer mine. I never got to bury her as she seemed to disappear out of thin air. 
A banshee is the ghost of a woman who cries in the night. She's known to warn you about a death of a loved one. I remember why those cries were familiar. I heard them the night this place took my wife. She had now become a banshee herself, the one to warn me of Albert's death. Narrated by Dorsey Jackson of Dorsey Jackson Global at Compound City. Be sure to like and subscribe. My name is Brock and I'm a 36-year-old detective. You've heard of police that encounter ghosts? This is my story. It started with a phone call. I was sitting in my office in Des Moines, Iowa, filling out some paperwork when my phone rang. I picked it up. Hello? It was the receptionist. Hi, Brock. The chief of police from Urbandale would like to speak to you. Go ahead and put him through, I said and hung up. The phone rang again. Detective Armstrong. Good evening, Detective. This is Chief Reed. I'm reaching out to you regarding the chain of murders that's been going through my town. We need some extra hands as they're becoming rampant. Yes, I've heard about these series of killings. How can I help? Well, whoever the killer is, they haven't gone anywhere. It's as though they're waiting to get caught. Yet we see no clues that leave any sort of DNA evidence behind. We hear you specialize in tough cases. I'll come up first thing in the morning to discuss the recent cases. Have the autopsy reports ready. Thank you, detective. See you in the morning. I got up early the next day and grabbed a coffee and a bagel to enjoy as I made the short drive to Urbandale. I met up with the chief in his office and I looked over the autopsy reports. Take me to see the bodies, I told him. We don't go to the morgue before 10 a.m. I looked at him warily. Why not? Well, the morgue is haunted and strange activities have been known to occur until the sun shines through the east windows. That's usually around 10 in the morning. I don't believe in ghosts. Take me there and I'll go in myself. I need to see the bodies mirror what the report says before I can dive into the investigation. I don't have all day to do this. If you insist. Reed answered and grabbed a set of keys. He drove us both over to the morgue and he unlocked the door so I could go in. I went in and closed the door behind me. I turned on the lights and made my way to the freezers where they kept the corpses. As I walked in, the lights flickered a bit. I heard a noise and stopped to see a body bag on a table. It appeared to have a body inside it, but it was closed. I went through the door marked murder victims and looked for the labels that matched the report. I opened the freezer and pulled one of the corpses out. I began to examine the body and read through the report when I heard a zipper just outside the door. I stopped reading so that I could concentrate on the sound. I looked around to see if the pathologist had come in as it was 9.30 a.m. Just then, I heard the zipping noise from behind me. The body bag on the table was suddenly behind me and the zipper was going down very slowly. I backed away startled. I told myself that I just didn't get enough sleep last night and should not have included that extra shot of espresso in my coffee. I closed my eyes and hoped when I opened them again, the body bag would be gone and all have just hallucinated. To my horror, when I opened my eyes, I watched the corpse of a man sit straight up. He turned and looked at me, and my blood ran cold as a sinister smile stretched across his face. He tilted his head to one side, then the other. He just watched me, and I stood there as though I had suddenly become paralyzed. I backed away as the corpse climbed off the table, and an ice-cold hand grabbed me by the wrist. I looked back, startled to see the corpse had grabbed me, and went to take a bite out of my arm. But I pulled back. I stumbled over a table that had syringes, scalpels, and bottles of fluids, knocking it all over as I ran for the door and leave this building. The corpses began to chase me, and I ran full speed for the exit when I suddenly ran into Chief Reed. Oh, thank God. I heaved a sigh of relief. Detective, you look as though you've seen a ghost. I looked behind me and the corpses were nowhere to be found. I must have hallucinated. I shook my head. No, I think the smell of formaldehyde just got to me. I told you not to come here before 10 a.m. You didn't listen to me, Reed said as an evil grin formed on his face. I pulled out my gun and pointed it at Reed. Back off or I'll shoot, I hollered. Reed began to laugh maniacally. Ha 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 ha! You idiot! I told you strange things happen here if you come before 10 a.m. The other corpses didn't listen to me either. Listen to you? I asked in confusion. Deny seeing a ghost all you want, detective, for you're staring at one. And anyone who comes into the morgue before 10 a.m. becomes a ghost as well. With that, he lunged at me and I broke into a sprint towards the exit. 
I don't know how I didn't notice, but the entire town seemed quiet and deserted. I looked behind me and saw Chief Reed standing by a window and waving at me with that bone-chilling grin on his face. I got in my car and sped out of Urbandale, told my secretary never to answer another call from there again. My name's Devin and I'm a 36-year-old detective. I've been chasing a serial killer for the past two years all over the United States. This time we're chasing him through Alaska, where he's unfortunately harder to track. I'm standing at the latest crime scene in an alley of a restaurant. Victim's female, red hair, looks to be in her early 20s. I look at the woman who reported the body. Did you know the victim? She shook her head. No, but I own this restaurant and I was closing up when I found her in the dumpster. I looked over the poor victim. She was covered in blood from having her throat slashed. Her body showed signs of a struggle. Did anyone in your restaurant seem suspicious? How so? Any kind of suspicious behavior? Did anyone seem flustered, agitated, nervous? Well, there was one man. He actually looked a bit like you. Tall, handsome, but he wore some raggedy clothes. His shirt was torn and his pants smelled. He just wanted some water. How long ago was this? She nipped her lip as she thought for a long moment. Two or three hours ago? He caused no trouble, so I paid him no mind. He just drank the water and left. I took down the notes and offered her my business card to contact me if she had any more information. I then got into my car and drove down to the morgue where an autopsy would be done on the victim. After running her DNA through the computer, we were able to pull up her ID and emergency contact. I called her aunt and uncle. Her uncle was the one to pick up. Whoever this is, it's past midnight. Call again tomorrow. Sir, please don't hang up. I'm Detective Walsh. You can call me Devin. Do you by chance know a young woman by the name of Cassandra Miller? Cassie? The man shrieked on the other line, and I heard him call his wife into the room. Then a woman spoke over the phone. You're a detective? Yes, ma'am. Are you the aunt of Cassandra? I am. Gerald and I have been trying to find her for a week. The police have been no help. Have you found her? We found her, I said hesitantly. Before we continue this conversation, I think you need to come down to the station. I'll need to see some identification. I went to the station and met the couple there. They were indeed the aunt and uncle of Cassandra. Please tell us what happened to our niece, Mr. Miller pleaded. Mr. Miller, I'm afraid your niece has been murdered tonight. Time of death was around three hours ago, I informed them compassionately. Mrs. Miller collapsed against her husband, sobbing hysterically and demanding to see her. Mr. Miller began to demand a seer, too. I won't be taking you to seer. This isn't how you want to remember her. I want to see the bastard who killed her, Mr. Miller demanded. We haven't caught him yet. We believe her murder is linked to a chain of murders across the U.S. over the last two years. If the suspect is who I think it is, he's been very difficult to catch. I left the couple to sit at the station and fill out statements of the time Cassandra disappeared. I'd gotten a call from the restaurant owner to inform me she had some security footage of the gentleman in question. She gave me the disc of the footage and I took it home to watch on my laptop. I plugged the disc into my computer and began to see the gentleman enter the restaurant. I was shocked to see that she wasn't wrong. He did look just like me. I zoomed to take a closer look and the man looked up at the camera and it was as though he had looked into my eyes. Suddenly. Memories that seemed to be my own of earlier that night began flashing through my mind. I was walking the ice-cold streets of the city when a homeless man approached me. Got any spare change? He asked me. He wore a shirt and pants just like in the security footage. I've got just the thing to put you out of your misery, I smiled. And he looked at me with hopeful eyes when I began to beat him. I wailed on him until he was dead. I took the clothes and went to my car. I changed into his clothes and parked my car in a parking lot down the block of the restaurant. I walked the streets and found an attractive woman. It was Cassandra. I offered her money in exchange for her body. She slapped me and I punched her in the stomach, dragging her into the alley. She fought against me, but I easily overpowered her. I took a knife from the man's pocket and slashed her throat. She bled out nearly instantly and I stood up to look around. I couldn't have anyone finding her like this, so I dumped her body into the dumpster. I ducked into the restaurant to wash the blood off my hands and face. No one seemed to notice me, and I came out to order a glass of water. I was parched after all that wrestling. I left the restaurant and went back to my car where I drove home and disposed of the clothes. I just realized the pocket knife was left at the crime scene and taken for evidence. It won't be long now before they find me. 
That serial killer I've been tracking turned out to be me all along. And I better get the hell out of Dodge before they find my fingerprints and I black out again. I closed my eyes and pointed to a random place on the map. Los Angeles, California. Lock your doors. <laughs>